Good morning, everyone. So good to have you here. Thank you for making some time and being here. If you are a member of this congregation, thank you for keeping the appointment on the first day of the week uh, to gather together, to encourage each other and to build each other up through song and prayer, mutual study of God's word, and just simply by being here. So I appreciate you, and I very, 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 very much thank you for doing that. And if you are a guest, I try to say this every, every Sunday that we are here, we as a congregation recognize that you as a guest can be anywhere, uh, doing anything with the time that God has given you, and yet you have chosen to give some of that time to us. And as a congregation, we are encouraged by you being here, we are humbled by you uh, being here, and we thank you for being here. And if there's anything that you hear, anything that you see, anything that uh, may elicit a question, if we can help you in that, I know you can ask any of us that are members and we'll be more than happy to do that. Brother Chuck, thank you for choosing this church family. We recognize that and we thank you for that. And it's a, it is always an honor and a privilege when someone chooses us because we know what it's like to be chosen because God chose us so long ago in Christ. And we can't wait to work alongside of you. And we can't wait to serve you, uh, to serve you and your family, to serve God and to serve this community. I also know that for the last two weeks, for many of us, even if we, even now, if we happen to turn on any news program that we're carrying around the weight of what's happening across the world. And the images and the things that we are seeing on news programs, and then what has changed in the last 10 years, now social media. Uh, did someone, once, uh, someone said earlier this week that I was listening to that uh, this will perhaps be the very first war that will be played out on social media, and that we will see almost in real time. And I know that's weighing heavy on our hearts and our mind, and I hope that we are responding with that weight, uh, to that weight and that heaviness with prayer. And I hope that we are taking encouragement that besides, yes, the pain and suffering that we're seeing, we're also seeing Christians gathering together and singing. We're also seeing brothers and sisters gathering together and supporting one another. That despite all of that, that's happening. And I can imagine, right? A missile flying over the head. Gunshots not in the too far distance. And yet they find a way to be together. And it reminds us of the power of being together, doesn't it? And no matter what we face, whether it's here now, in this country, and in our own life, or those halfway across the world. So I hope that we're praying, but I hope we're taking some strong encouragement of what it looks like to live out faith, even in the midst of all of those things that are going on with that. And the New Movers Ministry will start next week as we got a fresh batch of addresses of those who are moving into our area. If you'd like to participate or if you'd like to help out in any way, you can do so. You can talk to Tom. He's right over there in the corner. Uh, Tom is not bashful, so he will find you if you uh, don't find him. Uh, but that also goes for Dennis, myself, and others in that case. But again, thank you so much for being here. Many of you are familiar with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. One of the most well-known, if not well-known, works of C.S. Lewis. It's in that work that four siblings, two brothers, two sisters, find a magic wardrobe. There they're transported to the magical world of Narnia. When they first enter, the white witch has taken a hold of everything. It's just almost an everlasting winter. And I don't imagine an everlasting winter. We, we're kind of enjoying the, the, the pre-warm-up, I guess you could say the spring-like weather and temperatures that are here, but the whole idea of this area being wrapped up in an everlasting winter is just to show how sad and depressing things have gotten in the land of Narnia. Everybody's talking about this return, this Aslan, this lion that will come and save them. Throughout the course, one of the brothers, throughout the course of the series, uh, story, one of the brothers, Edmund, ends up falling for the trap and the temptation of the white, white witch. Turkish delight was his downfall. He didn't know that that was going to put him in the crosshairs of being completely gone. Separated from his brothers, his, sis his sisters. Put under the direct power of the white witch. 
So when you reach chapter 15 of the book, Aslan, who has already appeared onto the scene, there's something that's got to be done because the white witch understands the magic of the land. There's no way that Edmund can walk free. There's no way in which Edmund can be let loose and just all forgiven. She can't just let it be. Her power has too much of a grip. Her power has too much of a hold on Edmund. So something's got to be done, but no one can do it. Mr. and Miss Beaver cannot do it. None of his sisters can do it. No one can take care of the problem that's there. Till one night after a talk that took place between the White Witch and Aslan, he walks off in the middle of the night quietly. It happens that the two sisters, Susan and Lucy, are awake. And they wonder, what's, what's he doing? Where's he going? And they follow him at a distance. And there they discover that he goes to not just the white witch, but the horde that she has under her command. There he's tied up. His mane is shaved. And a knife is plunged that kills him a stone table. Lucy and Susan are crying. They can't believe what they've heard. They can't believe what they have seen. They can't believe that everything has just come to this. Did, did we travel to this mysterious land just for all of this to happen? These hopes, these dreams, everything was pinned on this lion and now he's, he's, not, he's dead. So I pick up in the middle of chapter 15 with this, quote, at the moment they, that is Susan and Lucy, heard from behind them a loud noise. A great cracking, deafening noise as if a giant had broken a giant's plate. The stone table was broken into two pieces by a great crack that ran down from it end to end. And there was no Aslan. Who's done it? cried Susan. What does it mean? Is it more magic? Yes, said a great voice from behind their backs. It is more magic. And they looked round. And there, shining in the sunrise, larger than they had seen him before, shaking his mane, for it had apparently grown again, stood Aslan himself. Oh, Aslan, cried both the children, staring up at him, almost as much frightened as they were glad. But what does it mean? Asked Susan. Now, if you know... C.S. Lewis and the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, and we'll pick back up with the rest of the story a little bit later. You know he loves his allegory. What does it mean? What does it mean for Jesus to have asked the question, who do people say that I am? And for Peter to give the answer, well, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. It's great. That's what I needed to hear because based on this rock, this rock, this confession, I will build my church. And for the month of February, we looked out at what this confession is, this called out people of God that he's going to build, that Jesus is going to build. And then right after this is this curious exchange with Jesus and Peter. For whatever reason, Jesus just based on that confession and maybe the light just came on and he's seeing it flickering within Peter's eyes and he hears the excitement within Peter's voice. Now's the time to tell him the deepest truth of them all. That the Son of Man must go to Jerusalem. The Son of Man must be arrested. He must be tried. He must suffer and he must die. At that moment, the entire tone of Matthew, Mark and Luke all take a shift. Because at this point, it was about healing people, helping people, feeding people, doing things for other people. And now Jesus puts it squarely on him. And he says, the son of man, me, I must go to Jerusalem and I must die. And the question that is on Peter's mind and everybody's mind is, well, what does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean that he's got to go and suffer and die? What does it mean that he's got to be arrested and tried? What does it mean? What's the meaning behind everything that we're going to read from here on out? And for us as a congregation, what does it mean as we embark on moving from a called out people of God to becoming a cross-shaped people of God? 
What does it mean for you and for I and for us in totality to shift from being called out to being cross-shaped? What does it mean? Which means that we've got to start at the very beginning, right? Why does Jesus have to die in the first place? Why is it that there has to be a cross, a brutal instrument of death, of suffering and death? Why does there have to be something like that in the first place? Why does that exist? Why is that even there? Well, if you look through all of the gospel accounts, and that's just what we're going to do for the sake of time, but we're summarizing the entire message of what we know of as the Old Testament and up to this point. There are some things that Jesus will say, and quite simply it says, what is humanity away from God? If God is not in the picture and humanity's just here all by itself, and it's got the spotlight on it and it's front and center, who is humanity away from God? If God's over here, and humanity's front and center under the lights, who's humanity? And Jesus, at various times throughout the Gospels, all four of them will speak of who we are. Luke 17, 1, he will speak of those with a woe unto them that come temptations to sin. That to be away from God, to for humanity be front and center, but God out of the picture is a woeful thing. Because there is a package deal with humanity, and that is something called sin. A missing of the mark. A falling short of a goal. Whatever it is, however definition we use to wrap our minds around it, sin is atrocious. Enough for Jesus to call it a woe. And And where does this come from? Is it just some entity that's out? Is it a white witch that's just roaming around in a land in an everlasting winter? No, sin is a lot more worse than that. It's actually not on the outside. Jesus will say on numerous occasions that it's on the inside. That its roots are found within the human heart. Matthew 15, 10 through 20. That it's out of the human heart. Not from the outside, but from the inside of a human heart. Come all sorts of things that we have given names But they're all called sin, whether it's foul language, or whether it's gossip, or whether it's adultery, or whether it's sexual immorality, whether it's cheating or lying. All of these things, Jesus will put not just humanity, but the human heart front and center and says, out of it comes all of that. The woe doesn't come from the outside in. The woe comes from the inside out. And then you've got this curious case, this conversation between Jesus and religious leaders. And there's a woman who's been literally caught in adultery in John chapter 8. Come just dragging her and she's just a tool. She's just something to be used. She's not a person to them. But Jesus gives one of the most powerful images as they have rocks already in their hand and they're ready to stone her. And he says, you who have or those of us who have no sin, you cast the first stone And the text says that everybody just drops it. And it's in that moment that the reason why everybody drops the stone, why all of us don't put the spotlight on someone else, why it's completely on me, because everybody has it. Everybody has it. Who is humanity? Humanity is ultimately, according to Jesus, humanity is lost. This trajectory of sin shows no partiality for anybody. I like how Leonard Allen put it in his book, Cruciform Church, that the cross puts our lives to the test. So let's put it in real terms, in real life. What we are seeing halfway across the world is evil, is it not? How do you wake up and leverage power to bring pain and suffering to someone? Much less an entire country. It's evil. Pure and simple, it's evil. And it's it's shocking. (laughs) No matter how many times we hear of wars and rumors of wars, when it finally happens, it's just shocking because of the brutality that comes with it, what that evil does. How do you fire on orphanages? 
How do you chase people to surrounding countries? And every one of us, all of us, starting right here with me, we have no problem identifying that that is evil. And the cross reveals that, doesn't it? But here's the thing. This is how the cross reveals. Here's how the cross puts our own life to the test. How am I any less evil of the sin that is in me? How, how am I any less than that? In the eyes of God, it's in the eyes of human beings, we deal with levels. Tier one, tier two. But in the eyes of God, there are no tiers, are there? There are no, there's not a tier one and a tier two. There's not a level one and a level two. Because everybody has gone wayward with their own heart. You see, the cross puts our life to the test because it exposes the sin that's in us. It exposes the current condition of the heart. It exposes who I am away from God, left to my own devices, left to my own decisions, left to my own choices, left to my own path. It exposes who I am. So let's put it in another perspective. This is the picture of the Antarctic. Do you know it's considered to be one of the three harshest places on this planet? Very little to no life. It can get as cold as minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit. Who was there to measure that? That's what, that's, that was my first question when I came across it. Who was there to measure that? Who volunteered? I'll go. <laughs> that's harsh. That's harsh. Man, that's, that's cold. On the opposite end of the spectrum is the Sahara Desert that can get up to as hot as 104 degrees. And we think, oh, that's, we're North Carolina. Let's add some humidity to that, right? Those of you from Alabama, you would know that too. Here's the thing that it's hot as it gets here. It's maybe a day, a couple of days at a time, maybe a few weeks. It stays 104 degrees months at a time in the Sahara Desert. Can you imagine that? 104. And again, the question is needs to be asked. Who was there to measure that? The Australian outback is considered to be somewhere in between where it can get very brutally cold and very brutally hot. Harsh is the word. Can I just be honest to say that sin is the harshest condition known to man? Not a brutal cold, not a brutal heat, but a brutal realization of what sin does to our hearts. Because you see that, that if Jesus is right, and he is, he's always right. If sin ultimately means that I am lost, and God is out of the picture, and it's just me, front and center, again, the light's on me. And it reveals and exposes the current condition of my heart, and the evil, and the sin, and the passions, and everything that I've just given myself into. Then in this life, and should I die in that condition in the next life, that is the worst and harshest condition that a human being can ever find themselves in. Not the Antarctic, and not the Sahara Desert. Now, can I ask the question again, who wants to find out how harsh that is? Because I don't. What does it mean? It means we're lost. It means we're lost. But Jesus doesn't leave us there. God doesn't leave us there. And, and yet questions come because we know this. We know it in our, the deep recesses of our heart and our soul. We know the current condition of who we are. We know what's, what we have done. We know what we have said. We know what we have done with our time. And, and the questions that come then are, are about God then. Is God eager to punish us then? If we're all lost? Is God eager to just give us up? And give up because we are lost causes? Is God happy to see us reap what we have sown?
need you to know that if that is any thought in your mind, the answer is an emphatic no. He is not happy to see us reap what we sow. And he is not eager to punish. And he is not eager to give up. Because that same verse that said that we were lost, that same Jesus that came and acknowledges that the entire human race is lost, there are also some words that precede that word. To seek and to save. What does it mean? What does, what does it mean in all of this? What does it mean? It means that God loves humanity. That's what it means. It means that God loves humanity. It means that God, whilst, while the cross exposes my sin, loves. Now, it's not a love that leaves me there and says, we'll just pretend as if it doesn't happen. It's not a love that says, well, it's okay, we'll just, we all make bad choices, let's just pick up and move on. No, the stain is there. And it must be dealt with, and we'll talk about that in a later lesson. But it, what it does mean at this moment is that when Jesus must go to Jerusalem, and must be arrested, and must be tried, and must suffer, and must die, it means that God must love us. It's a love that's willing to make the choice to die. Why? Because there are no lost causes. Francis Spuford in a work unapologetic says this, quote, And Jesus is never disgusted. This is Jesus with us as his point of view. Jesus is never disgusted. He never says that anything or anyone is too dirty to be touched. That anyone is too lost to be found. Even in situations where there seem to be no grounds for human hope. He will not agree that hope is gone beyond recall. Wreckage may be written in the logic of the world. But he will not agree that is all there is. Jesus says, more can be mended than what you fear. Far more can be mended than what you know. Now, I almost stopped the sermon right there. But we need God to have the final words on things. So the way the John Apostle will put it, as the New Living Translation has it, God showed how much He loved us by sending His one and only Son into the world. So that we might have eternal life through Him. This is real love. Not that we loved God. But that He loved us and sent His Son as a sacrifice. To take away our sins. So what does God do with the exposed evil? What does God do with the ungodliness that is sin? What does God do with the unrighteousness? What does God do with all of these things? He sacrifices His one and only Son because this is what real love does. Real love doesn't punish. Not yet. Oh, it, it can come and it will. There is a, there's a, a place that makes us uncomfortable that is reserved for the devil and his angels and for sin and for death and it's called hell. But that's not what God is eager to do. He is eager to seek and he is eager to save because he is eager to love. Are you ready to be loved? Are you ready to be mended far more than what you know? Are you ready to lay aside the disgustedness that you believe that maybe God has towards you and instead realize what the scripture emphasizes in so many places? That real love is not that we loved him, but that he loved us and sent his son to die for us. That it's not just that he sent Jesus. But that Jesus died. 
And instead of us being exposed to the consequences and the harshest elements of sin, Jesus is exposed with nails in his hands and lashes on his back and a crown of thorns on his head. Why? Because God is eager to love. Because God is eager to save. And this is who he is. What does it mean? I like the end of this the story as we pick back up with the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe. Susan asked, but what does it mean when they were somewhat calmer? And it means, says Aslan, that though the witch knew the deep magic, there is a magic deeper still, which she did not know. Her knowledge goes back only to the dawn of time. But if she could have looked a little further back into the stillness and the darkness before time dawn, she would have read there is a different incantation. She would have known that when a willing victim who had committed no treachery was killed in the traitor's stead, the table would crack and death itself would work backwards. The enemy cannot go back before time. Because if he did, he would have known of the love of God that existed. The love that he has for all of humanity. Whether humanity loves him back or not. So as we draw this to a close, I want to put us in two different groups in our mind, if that's okay. For one, there are some of us that it's now time to respond to God's love. We've delayed as long as we can. It's now time. It's not time to respond just simply because of guilt or shame, but because God is eager to seek and God is, able, is eager to save. Because God is eager to love you this morning in Christ, where all spiritual blessings are found, forgiveness and a clean conscience and a pure heart that's washed in His blood that was shed on the cross based on love. And for some of us, today is the day to rise and be baptized and wash away our sin. It's now time. It's now time. But for the majority of us here, we've got to deal with something else that'll close us out this morning and set the groundwork for next week, Lord willing. Mark chapter 8 and verse 33, Peter responds to this news that, he must su that Jesus must suffer and die. That's, that's not the plan, Jesus. That's, that is far be it from you. That... That's not how kings operate. Kings rule. They don't die. And so Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. For you're not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. If we're correct in what the scripture says, that the things in the mind of God is based first and foremost on love. Then yes, Peter, you have gotten that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, but I must do all of these things because I love humanity. But that also means something else. That means that I have to figure out how I see humanity. Do I see human beings in the way that God sees them? When their sin is exposed to me, what, what will I be eager to do? What will I be eager to respond with? Oh, love, love doesn't make an excuse for it. And love doesn't pretend that it doesn't exist. But will I be willing to love like he did? So the Apostle Paul will put it this way, that in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. How can your faith work through love this week? I know how it worked through God in Christ. I know that he went to a cross, and I know as we will see, and many of us know, we must pick up our own cross and follow him. So how will my faith work through love this week? Will it be a faith that doesn't go one mile but two? Is it a faith that will love my enemy? Will it be a faith that seeks to be peacemaker? Will it be a faith that forgives? Will it be a faith that gives mercy or compassion? Will it be, what, will, what will it be? How will my faith work through love this week? 
What will I do with the other human beings in my life? Will I do what God did with me or will I do what the enemy did with me? What will I do? What does it mean for me if I have come up out of the water? What does it mean for me? And it means to live by faith, but a faith that works through love. Maybe a faith that is eager to love, a faith that is eager to seek, a faith that is eager to save. So A. Marie and Grace and I started the second season of The Chosen. We'll close with this. There's a part where Thomas, what A. Marie and I assume at least was maybe his wife, or at least the way the show is putting it, coming to Jesus. After he had turned water to wine in the first, in the first season, they appear in the, second, the first episode of the second season. I'll get it out. It's a conversation between Jesus and actually the father-in-law. Or at least what we got. If we're reading it wrong, let us know. But Jesus looks at him because he had openly admitted, I can't, I can't do what they're doing. I acknowledge what you did, but I, I just can't. He's packing up his things and he's going to go home. And Jesus, the way that I assume he is portrayed, looks at him and acknowledges that. Because he's not here to force anybody to do anything that they don't want to do. But he does look at him and say, For those who do not follow me, I require very, very little. But those who do choose to follow me, I require a lot. What does it mean for those of us who are followers of his? Pick up our cross and to love humanity the way that he did. Perhaps this week, it is now time for our faith to work through love. A love that makes no excuse for sin. Exposes it and acknowledges it. But knows that it can be forgiven. If a person is willing. So this is what it means. What does it mean to you as we stand and sing?